Oh, bright, beautiful morning, sitting here getting unloaded. And I figured what a better time than now to do a part two of my testimony. When I shared a lot of the, uh, the other video for the first part of my testimony, I uh, seen a lot of comments. People were saying part two, please. So I figured, well, I'll, I'll hop on here. I can do part two, probably part three, part four. Um, now, in the first one, I went all the way back to kind of give you guys an understanding what my dad had went through, his dad, you know, the generational curse thing. In the Amish growing up, we didn't recognize generational curses. I necessarily didn't realize what that is and what the problem is until after 2017 when I got saved. That is when the Holy Spirit really showed me a lot of things for why things happened the way they did. I could never make any sense why my life was a wreck, why everything was the way it was until I got saved. When I got into the Word of God, when I had a relationship with Jesus, then a lot, a lot of things made more sense because I understand the spiritual realm and how the enemy works. The enemy was stealing, killing, and destroying. And sadly, my friends, there's a lot of Amish families in this same predicament. And that is why I try to love them, help them. We have Amish Rescue Mission. That's why I'm also affiliated with them. Uh, a lot of the things I shared in my first part of the testimony in the other video is what resulted in what I'm doing now, online ministry and reaching out to those that are still in these communities because I get it and I understand it. And the biggest thing I have been doing is talking with those that are leaving, talking with those that are still in the communities. There's a lot of them. I, I was pretty shocked how God uh, brought a lot of those to me because of online ministry, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. And I'm speaking with them on a daily basis, encouraging them, letting them, them know they're not alone, and also letting them know the truth so that they can also be delivered. Now, to dive into part two of my testimony, I want to start out by letting you know all of what happened, what I shared in the first video, all that gruesome, stressful, depression, anxiety, abuse, physical, out of physical abuse. My mom, my poor mother got the front end of it. And I want to share with you how the stress level on my mom was so intense. She went through so much of a living hell. And that's what it was that I remember how skinny of a twig she was. She never hit 100 pounds my entire lifetime growing up. And I will share with you, just to give you an idea, what stress can do, what depression and stress can do on a, on a physical body. After 2003, after my dad had committed suicide, after my dad was gone, I went out to visit my mother. I have never seen my mother over 100 pounds. She was 95 to 98 pounds almost the whole time. And she had all 10 of us kids with that weight. And she all at once was filled out. She, she had a glow. She looked healthy. And I asked mom, I said, you really gained some weight. And that's a good thing. You look healthy. She goes, yeah. And she acknowledged. She acknowledged that. The stress that was there all of our life growing up. She recognized now that that, that was what was really weighing on her body. She looked like she was 80 years old when she was 40. Because of the stress. And now all at once she says, yeah, I'm almost 200 pounds. And I, and I just smiled and I said... I'm glad you're healthy, Mom, and I'm glad you're stress-free. But she still acknowledged that. I just wish your dad was still here. You know, that showed me that my Amish mother still loved my father. She was willing to forgive him after all that he put her through. That stands out to me. That's a very forgiving heart. She would still rather have the stress. She would still rather live in that just to have him around. Wow. Just wanted to share that to start out with. Now, guys, because of what I shared in the first testimony, because of how our father was, that is why we, me and my 
brothers were really heavily bullied. We were bullied very extremely to where you had suicidal thoughts. You know, show them bullies. You're not going to tolerate it. You're just going to eliminate yourself. Uh, speaking with my Amish brothers when I visit them, I see a lot of that in them as well, where there was a lot of bullying going on. You know, we didn't, uh, we, we wasn't treated the same because of how our dad was, obviously. So we had, we had endured a lot of bullying at a young age, made fun of. If you even tried to talk about some bad things are going on and you tried to cry, yeah, you're a baby. We got called babies if we were crying. So we really growed up uh, trying to hide everything, shove everything deep inside and, and show them that we're strong, show them that there's nothing wrong here. And we were pretty, I, was, I got pretty good at showing that, hey, I'm okay. I'm a strong man. But inside I was, I was uh, hurting pretty bad. Now, I remember when our barn burnt down when I was 14 years old. This was in 1994. And I remember, um, I thought I was going to get praised. I was expecting to be a pat on the back, good job, and be praised. Because in the middle of the night, about 1 o'clock, there was a really hot yellow glow on my side of the house. We were always upstairs. There was 10 of us kids, but we, didn't, we, had a, we were very, very poor growing up. We never had any money. And uh, I remember uh, all of us had to squish in one room. The girls had to be in a separate room because the boys and girls couldn't sleep together. We were not allowed to know that girls were different from boys in areas of your body. We all thought, I, I thought for a long time growing up, that girls were the same as boys. We didn't know that they had different body parts. There was no sex education. So we, we just didn't have none of that, none of that ex education. But anyway, we were sleeping in the middle of the night, and there was uh, me and my twin brother. We had a bed we shared, and there was a couple feet gap, and then you had two, two more brothers, and then you had a couple feet gap and two more brothers. And uh, I remember waking up, and uh, there was this intense heat on the side of the house and, uh, and a bright, bright glow. And I remember the uh, curtain, I just barely shoved it back, and, the, and I, got, I realized that the entire barn was engulfed in flames. And I started screaming just to let everybody know our barn's on fire. And uh, I just barely started waking my brothers up. And my mom, I heard her yelling and screaming, Boys, boys, come on, the barn's on fire. And, uh, and uh, hopefully you guys can hear me still. I had a call trying to come in there. But anyway, um, I ran, uh, you know, we all ran out, outside. I was the first one to get to the barn. And I remember dad was nowhere to be seen. He was already out of the house, which sometimes looking back, I, I don't know what all was going on. But I just know that um, I got to the barn door and I knew that the, the peak was already starting to fall down in certain areas. And I shoved this barn door wide open and nothing was coming out. So I, I proceeded to enter and feel around. It was really smoky, really hot. And I was able to kick a couple cows. We got I got five of them out of the barn some of them were barely walking they were so weak but I, I tried to get more because we had a whole bunch of cows and i remember getting five of them out that were able to get to safety and uh, i thought i was gonna get uh, a pat on the back and get praised for that but i got a really heavy beating for that i got a spanking for that um because they they said uh, well first of all the fire department when they got there they were yelling that I would even attempt to go try. They said, you, you, we can, we can replace those cows, but we can't replace you, which was okay. I understand that. But because, uh, I put my life in danger and trying to get in there, I, I got, uh, opposite from being praised. I just remember that. that that's one thing that stuck with me because I was really thought, well, now I'll finally get some kind of praise and I'll, I'll, I'll get a pat on the back or something. But the other thing I want to say about the barn fire, there was no specific reason why the barn caught on fire in the middle of the night. We never found out why. The, the, the fire department really didn't, we didn't get no answers because everything, it took so long to get to an English neighbor to call the fire department. By the time my da dad got that done, the whole barn was burned to the ground. I mean, there's no evidence. You know, it, you can't really even do an investigation. But I do know that my own personal suspicion, there's a lot of bullies, a lot of Amish that... Um, try to get even with one another and uh, I, I suspect that it was intentional by someone but I we don't know that so I just wanted to share that now um, one more thing that I'll add to this one that I didn't in the first testimony 
I shared a couple abusive situations. I want to share this one for the reason that um, I don't hold none of this stuff against my father, but I do want to share that I was out for a while. I don't remember it, but my mom and my brothers talking to me about it because they remembered it more vividly than I did since I was unconscious. But my father at one point, just to show you kind of his rage and his anger that he had, uh, he took he was upset that I threw uh, a shovel in and I didn't hear him inside the corn crib. And I didn't even know he was in there. I think he was in there drinking and real quiet and didn't want to get caught. And I pulled up with the horses and the wagon and I threw the, uh, the shovel in and it hit him. Uh, I didn't know he was in there. Uh, it was an accident. He came out and, and my twin brother, my twin brother Levi came up and uh, he was trying to get, you know, side with me. Well, long story short, my dad grabbed both of our heads and smacked us together. We were just little boys. And I was out. I had a major concussion. I, my mom and my oldest brother, remember, I remember them talking about that. Uh, that bothered them more than well, I was out. So I, I, I'm kind of blank in that area. But I do know that I was shocked when I came to finally. Uh, I was shocked to learn that uh, I had been out for almost 18 hours. Uh, no doctor. Uh, my family was very poor. The Amish in my family we didn't have a rule that we couldn't go to the doctor. But we just didn't go to the doctor. We were very poor because of my dad's habits, obviously. Uh, we just didn't have any money. And, and same way with when I fell out of the barn. When I fell out of the barn and broke all these ribs, I had a lot of eternal bleeding. I had brain fluid coming out. Now, now that one there, I can tell you, looking back, after I got to know the Lord, I can look back at my fifth grade, in fifth grade when I fell out of the barn, I can tell you that that was supernaturally God saving me because he had plans for my life. But when have you ever heard of someone surviving, puking up blood because of that eternal bleeding in, in your body, because of that eternal injury, internal? Internal bleeding was caused because all my ribs were, were crushed. And uh, <clears throat> his death. I remember in the house you know we didn't take the precautions like emts yep they're bending me they're getting me into the house and i fainted i passed out multiple times because i was getting so weak from losing blood and i've shared that before i think where where i fell out of the barn and uh, we just didn't go to the hospital you know we didn't have no money and i remember hearing dad talk about well he's either going to survive or he'll die there was no discussion about going to the hospital we have no money we're not taking him to the doctor and so, obviously, as a young child, I thought I was going to die. But we just didn't go to the hospital for anything. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, my brother got real bad. He's got really bad. Uh, his nerves and everything were cutting his fingers. We didn't go to the hospital for that. There's many things that happened with, between me and my family members that could should have resulted in getting stitches. But we have scars everywhere because we never went to the doctor. <laughs> uh, my oldest brother, Alvin... He almost died when he would, before I was born. He was just a little baby, and he actually had an um, uh, appendix. Now, you guys know as very well as I do that if you don't take care of your appendix, when it, it'll burst, and it did. It burst in, in my brother when he was just a little baby. And uh, they, uh, they were getting together with some of the uh, family members, and they were getting ready to let him die. And my grandma and my uncle said, uh, just the way he's acting and how his belly's tight, I think it's appendix. We're going to pay for it. We'll take him to the hospital. So that shows you not all Amish are against going to the hospital. If they have the money, they'll do so. But my family, my mom and dad just didn't do it. But anyway, they did take my brother to the hospital. And I remember that story growing up, how Alvin, my oldest brother, was almost dead because the doctor said if they didn't come in when they did, it was already burst. And it was, it was an infection. It was like gangrene. And they had to cut a lot of that stuff out. And uh, they, they literally said that they don't even know how he made it. So God was watching over him as well. So uh, it, it was uh, infected. And it was like gangrene and growing already. So I just wanted to share that. Now I'm going to go back to the, uh, the bullying and rejection. I could talk about that all day long. Because of, of the bullying, I'm not good enough. I can tell you that my twin brother was ahead of me in learning. I was a slow learner. I had to be hands-on taught. I was slow in school. I was made fun of in the Amish school at uh, second grade. 
they were going to hold me back. They had a meeting with my mom and dad, and they said that they were going to pass me, or, or not, they were going to hold me back, but they're going to pass me because I have a twin, and they didn't want to separate the twins. And they kind of talked to my mom and dad about maybe holding me back, but that means my twin brother Levi would be have to be held back as well. Or they can just go ahead and pass me and, and allow us twins to move on and see how third grade does. Well, after that, they did pass us, by the way. And then after that, some of the bullies, you know, in school, in church, I look back and I just realized how much that affected me as a little, I'm bullying, stupid. You uh, wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for your twin, but it's just, but I'm just, I'm just sharing those things to show you how, why I'm not Amish. There was so many things. If you think English schools out here have bullying, you ain't seen nothing. The Amish schools are very, very brutal with bullying. And by the way, hurt people will hurt other people. Okay. I'm also guilty when I got into the upper years in school and also the youth group. When we joined the youth group, I also wanted to show dominance. And because it was done to me, I did it to others. There's a former Amish that left. And he shared with me after he left that, that well, actually two of them now that left. They shared with me how hurtful I was. I was a bully. But see how when I was bullied, the hurt people hurt other people. I ended up doing the same thing. I wanted to be dominant. I wanted to be like the bullies. I thought, well, if I fit in, if I fit in and act like they do, maybe I'll be accepted. Maybe I'll be part of the popular crowd. So I started bullying the same way. I was calling them names, making fun of them, giving them wedgies. So the rejection part was, I think, the biggest spirit that, I, that had to be prayed against me in my life when I got saved and I was struggling spiritually. Uh, a couple brothers in Christ recognized spiritually what was holding me hostage, and it was the spirit of rejection. And I was able to deal with that spirit finally in 2019 because uh, I, I wanted to please people. All of my life, I wanted to please people. I didn't. I wasn't accepted. You know, there was times where I didn't want to go to the barn racings in the Amish, the frolic. Mom and dad didn't know why. I wanted to stay on the farm, on the plow, with a team of horses all alone. I loved being alone. I was happy being alone. I didn't want to be around people. I didn't want to socialize because people always hurt me. People always rejected me. I, I wasn't welcome. So I wanted to be alone with my dog, my horses. And so when I didn't want to go to the barn racings and the gatherings where other Amish always get together to help one another, when mom and dad said it was my turn to go help, I didn't want to go because the fear of rejection. I had, I had nothing but rejection. You know, when my brother Levi, my twin brother, I remember when he was learning really fast and he was putting the harnesses on the horse properly and, and getting all the latches on and, and, and the buckles and tightening it up and hitching everything up and going to the, uh, the meetings with helping one another with farming, uh, thrashing oats, shredding corn, all of those things. Uh, he was ahead of the game. And if I attempted to, and did it wrong, and the other Amish had to help me, I, I, they laughed. I don't think any of my brothers were affected as much as I was when somebody <laughs> laughed at me because I messed up. <laughs> I mean, it's just something, looking back, I just, I don't know, I, it just really bothered me. I mean, I was, I was just so beaten up by those things that they were making fun of me, laughing at me. And if I cried because they laughed at me, now they laughed even more. Oh, he's a baby. And I hate it being called a baby. So there was just, I just like to share all of, you know, that's part of my testimony of, of why I, I left the Amish. You know, I, if I would have been loved and accepted the way I wanted to, I, I would still be Amish today. Uh, I didn't date a girl when we joined youth group. My, my twin brother started dating a girl. Uh, I didn't want to date a girl because I didn't think I was enough. I didn't think any girl would want this low life because I, I always felt like I wasn't good enough. I always thought there's no way any Amish woman would want me. So at an early age, as early as 12 and 13, I started planning up, even though I believed what I was taught that I'd go to hell if I left, I believed it, but I still felt always like hell would be better. I always thought if I could just get a couple years of my life 
in the English world to have freedom, it would be worth going to hell for that if I left the Amish. That will kind of give you an idea of why I chose to leave believing I would go to hell. I believed that for a long time. And I thought that would be worth it to go to hell just to be able to escape the, the, the pain and agonizing crap I went through. I thought it would be worth it. Just to kind of show you, uh, you know, the pallet shop. I'll share that with you too. The pallet shop next door to my parents was kind of my, my go-to, my freedom, my, my freedom of escape where I would go down and work there, and my, my dad allowed me to go down and work and make some money, had to give all the mon money to the parents, because in my Amish community, you couldn't have any money, you, you're not of your own, you're not an adult until you're 21. But I loved going down there working, because it got me away from home, it got me away from the other Amish, and I was working with English folks, with how I planned my escape with one of those English friends down there, his name was Todd. Now, <clears throat> I really got depressed and almost ended my life when my father came to me one Sunday and he said, the bishop and the elders came to me and they said, we walked by several times. We know your son Eli is working at the pallet shop among those worldly people and he, is, he could be tempted to use power tools. He could be tempted to listen to the radio, which they could hear the radio from the road. They always had a radio with a radio station, you know, playing music they could hear the air nailers and i was the guy sweeping cleaning and also stacking pallets and sorting pallets and and sorting different you know separating the sizes of the pallets the physical labor i was doing but they still told my father i must be yanked out of there because i was uh, tempted by the worldly people and that is also why they didn't allow us to go into the city limits to do construction for those that were on construction crews we were not allowed to work in the city limit where the English were Sunday evening. When I got home, I was doing the chores and I was up, up in the hayloft, ready to uh, throw uh, hay down to feed the horses. And I remember looking at the very long fall if I just landed on the concrete and ended my life. And I also looked at the rope, the rope that we used to pull the hay up. And I thought, you know, if I just put that around my neck, I could show these bleepity bleeps that I'm not going to tolerate it. That'll show you the effect that that had on me that I could no longer go to the pallet shop to get my mind off of everything that was happening at home. The abuse, the, the rejection, because the English people at the pallet shop, they smiled. They were friendly. They didn't make fun of me. They didn't mock me. They didn't, they wasn't bullying me. I felt loved. I felt accepted. By the way, the owner, Leo Smithberger, he was a godly Christian man. And I remember thinking, wow, that's what a real Christian looks like. That's not a pretending Christian. That's not somebody that says we are Christians and then hide abuse and evil things. See, that's why my eyes were opened. I worked among others that were not Amish and I saw love. I saw acceptance. And so you could about imagine that night standing in the barn, having those, obviously I had to. Dad would have gotten heavy backlash from the church if I wasn't pulled out of the uh, pallet shop. Now, after I left the Amish and I would visit mom, mom lots of times would say, I never knew what was on your mind. You wouldn't speak. That's because I knew I couldn't. If I spoke about what I just shared with you guys, about maybe ending my life that night, I would have got a heavy beating, a spanking. I would have got disciplined like you wouldn't believe to try to knock that out of me. That was my dad and mom's approach. So so I, I went into a bubble. I wouldn't talk about it. <coughs> also in the Amish church, it very much depended on who you was in my community. I do not want to portray all Amish as bad. And I do not want to, I have nothing but love for the Amish. I want to help them. I, I really, really love my people, the Amish. So I don't want to portray the Amish as bad, but I can tell you that in my particular Amish church in Kenton, Ohio, it depended on who you was. Some people got very harsh shunning, more weeks of shunning than others, depending on who you was. So another thing that really bothered me is how, because of who our dad was, 
we would get harsher punishment. You know, my mom would even get harsh punishment on, on stupid little things with her cap. If she made a new cap and didn't have enough creases in the back, uh, she got more weeks than one of the popular women. Maybe they may not even got anything out of it. And if the bishop's son or the bishop's daughter or the bishop's family members, aunts, uncles did something, they got busted. They just got no discipline. But if me and my family did the same thing, we got very heavy punishment, four to six, sometimes eight weeks in the ban. So I just wanted to kind of share that because it depends on who you was. And if you were not popular, like we, we were not popular at all um, because of our father, then we got such harsh punishment. Uh, you know, if you were baptized, you just, they put the hammer on you. Took a couple notes here so I don't forget a few things, but... Um, But anyway, this is why I now do what I do. See, God had a plan for me, and that is why I now have an online ministry. I love sharing the truth. And, and you know, for those of you that may not know the Lord, you may not understand wh why I would say such, such a thing. But I want you to understand that God allows everything to happen for a reason. I'm now who I am today because of what happened. It strengthened me. See, God uses what the devil has meant for be bad and evil, and God uses it for good. Uh, God protected me in my injury when I fell. I had brain fluid coming out. I was puking up blood. I should have died. Anybody would have died in that predicament, but God saved me, and I know that. Uh, that's why I preach with zeal, because I know that God did never, he never left my side, even when I didn't know God. Uh, God's grace found me in 2017 when I was not looking for him. He found me. I didn't find him. I was not looking for him, but he was with me the entire time. Now, in the in the first testimony video I shared, I shared the painful moments of when my father committed suicide 24 hours before I uh, was supposed to pick him up and he was going to leave the Amish. I want to go more in depth how that incident played out. In the first video, I was choked up. I was swallowing really hard. I was fighting back. I don't want to cry because that's that's one of my weaknesses. I was made fun of for that, and I still, I obviously still struggle. I don't. I try not to, but I will go in depth in this video and give you more details about how that played out. So, when my dad uh, committed suicide, he he went to the front of his head and he used a 38 special and. Uh, <clears throat> I often, as I uh, pray about that situation for God to give me peace in the situation, one thing that I have often got in the spirit was that my father also was wanting to be accepted. My father had also been rejected all of his life, and that's why he treated us that way. Again, hurt people hurt others. It's a generational curse, and it's got to be dealt with. But my belief, what, what I believe what God was giving me was that my father went very close to the front of his head thinking that it would injure him. But showing the Amish that he was serious, but I don't think he thought he was going to pass away. I think he did this to be accepted. I think he did this so that people would feel bad and, and accept him and feel bad and come to his side. And so... I truly believe what God showed me was dad was only doing this to be accepted because he was hurting. He was in pain, okay? That is why he was alive for so long. And, you know, when my brothers found him, his, his head was swollen three times the size of a normal head because of the injury. But he was alive and they found him praying. And I want to share this to show you something what God was doing in this situation. So remember how I said God uses all bad things for good? He was trying to send a message to the Amish because when my father was still alive, even though he, he was, it was bad, it, it was nasty, you should have been dead, the way, the way my brothers were de describing it, but they were watching him and listening to him pray. Guys, he was doing what the thief on the cross did. He was acknowledging that Christ was enough. He was repenting right there on his knees. He said he was on his knees, hands and knees, with, with that injury, you know, 
praying and asking God for forgiveness. And he was even asking for forgiveness of us out of everything he'd done wrong in his life. He was uh, saying the Lord's Prayer in German. Unser Vater in dem Himmel, deinem Werk, die dein Reich, komm They heard him pray that. And my brothers told me when they heard him pray that. So ne then I knew that my father was praying and seeking the Lord and asking for forgiveness. He did 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My dad did that. Now, I, that, that, now since I know my, my, my Bible, I know my dad was forgiven, just like the thief on the cross. My dad was forgiven. But what happened? Religious hypocrites did not forgive him. They charged him with murder. I acknowledge that's not the way to go out. But after the sin was committed, my dad made it right. He was forgiven. But do you see how God was sending a message to them? How dad was praying, asking for forgiveness, and was forgiven, made it right with the Lord, but they still judged him. God knew his heart, but the people, the religious cult, still judged him. And they buried my father separately in the corner. I've done videos on that before, a lot of you know. And they buried him separately, and they were wanting to put him all the way outside the cemetery. And uh, my mom and my oldest brother, they did say, hey, can, can we just put him inside? They said, well, if we put him inside the cemetery, we got to put fence around him in the corner. And they did. Until I, <laughs> I was ex-Amish at that time. I didn't tolerate that. I took the fence down. They rebuilt the fence and I took it down again. After taking it down twice, the Amish never put it up. Now they just destroy the flowers. See, for my comfort and healing, I always like putting flowers up. My buddy Andrew, he also went out and put flowers up. And they destroyed them every time. Now I'm fixing to, uh, soon, I'm not going to get, get the cat out of the bag yet, but we're getting ready to arrest some Amish here soon. But anyway, so we go to the hospital. And during the hospital visit, I had to wear Amish clothes, you know, and, and go to a Goodwill store, get a white shirt and black pants. And at the hospital, I remember I was trying to let mom and the other Amish know that dad was praying. Dad, dad made it right with the Lord. You guys are still judging him, you know. And uh, so I asked mom, I said, do you believe in anointing with oil? Well, well, yeah, yeah, we do. We do that when some of our church members that are baptized or dying, we anoint them with oil the way the Bible says. I said, well, how about you anoint dad with oil? Get a hold of the elders of the church and anoint my dad's head with oil. He made it right with the Lord. And you know what? My mom was shocked that her ex-Amish son would say that that it baffled her enough to where she actually talked to the bishop that was there to visit. And you know what? It blew, blows my mind to this day. They actually went in and anointed my dad's head with oil. And then he, see, they thought by anointing him that might, God might save, you know, keep him alive. They didn't look at it as he, he he's gonna, you know, he, he, they didn't think that he was forgiven. Me, I look at it the other way. If my dad dies, he was anointed with oil. Like the Bible says, he's already cleansed. He's already forgiven. He made it right with the Lord. But they still, since he passed away several days later in the hospital, on, he was on the life support until they took it off because he was brain dead. They still felt like since he died, that was still not right because he, what he did, it was a self-inflicted. They still would, they refused to believe that my father was forgiven. So they judged him and still buried him separately. But looking back, that was a shock to me that the Amish listened to a former Amish's advice and actually took oil and anointed my father's head. My, my mom brought that up, that that was so amazing. I brought that up. But now they don't really look at it as the anointing meaning anything because he passed away anyway. See, because they just, it's all about the physical realm. Anyway, I, I think that'll do it for my part two part two of my testimony, but I can tell you guys, um, God works out all things for good. Um, <clears throat> because I was rejected, I now help those that are rejected. A lot of Amish have reached out because of my online ministry. I have been able to um, help so many. Praise God for putting these people uh, at the right place at the right time to listen to these messages that can reach out. Uh, if you are somebody that has that needs help, encouragement, I love. I pray daily on the phone with with battered people. You don't have to be Amish or Mennonite. I don't care who you are. 
I know how to pray, okay? I, I use the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And I can break strongholds by the power, not me, I can't do nothing. But I can, because Christ abides in me and I abide in him, I love to pray and break your strongholds. And if you need prayer, please text me through my texting app that is set up for my ministry, 419-930-3583. And if you are being abused and you are in those communities and you have no hope and you have thought, like I mentioned in this video if you've had thoughts right here of ending your life because you don't know where else to turn I want you to know you can call Amish Rescue Mission and we will rescue you you tell us where you're at if you're laying in a ditch like a lot of them I've picked up so far laying in a ditch flat let me know what crossroad is close by if you want to be rescued you can call Amish Rescue Mission at 888-621-19 Eight, five. And we will do what we can to rescue you. And we want to love you. And we have Amish safe houses now that if you want to stay Amish and you feel like you're going to hell like I did for many years, you can remain Amish. We just want you to be safe. And we want to love you. And we also want you to make your own decisions without anybody telling you what to do. We want you to experience freedom in Christ and just love on you. And then by all means, I want to pray against those strongholds that were once in me, the enemy was holding me bondage with those strongholds. And I want to use the power and authority Jesus gives us in Luke 10, 19, where he said, I give you power and authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall harm you. When I use that power and authority to pray against your stronghold and my strongholds, the enemy leaves. He has to because there's a higher power there. He runs, he flees. You know, Jesus told the enemy when he was tempted, I do not live on bread alone, but I, but for it is written. He always said, for it is written. He went to the word of God. For it is written, I do not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's the higher, higher power and authority. And uh, just know that if you are in a mess, I don't care what background, reach out, text me. 419-930-3583. I would love to connect it with some of you guys. Uh, God has allowed me to go through some things, and I thank God. You know, that might, might sound bizarre to you guys, but I thank God. With every hurtful thing I've shared in the first testimony and in this video, I actually thank God and praise God for allowing me to go through everything that I did. Because I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't. I wouldn't have zeal and the love for Christ and the word of God if I didn't go through what I did. If I didn't realize how supernaturally God saved me, I, I wouldn't be able to have a ministry and help others the way I am. It's about working for the kingdom of God while we're here and glorifying God while we're here. It's less about me and more about he, him. Jesus the Christ. I must become less and he increases and becomes more. And when I use his power and authority and the love of Christ, I can help others sufficiently and effectively where the enemy cannot win. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy more abundantly. You all have a blessed day. Thank you for listening.